So this 11th day, finally, it was a, a father and son on snowmobiles. Yes. They saw you. They did. Do you remember much from when they found you? I don't remember what I did yesterday, <laughs> but I can close my eyes and I can remember every moment of Jake and Mike. Wow. Because they was, were the angels that saved my life. I mean, they're the reason that I'm here and I have this wonderful opportunity to share my story with you today because my life was saved on that mountain by Mike and Jake Estes. And come to find out, so Jake was the son in, in that northern area, they go snowmobiling for fun. Like we go to the beach and we go surfing. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their activities they do in their areas. And they had seen the car from a distance the day before. But they were used to seeing cars stuck in the area because people went to cut down Christmas trees and you just hiked out. It happened and then you get your car in the spring. Mm -hmm. But actually, Jake said to his father, Dad, I want to get closer to that car tomorrow. When we go out on our snowmobiles, I want to go check it out. He just thought something about the car. Yeah, okay. something about the car. And so for that's Jake's intuition, his feeling, his gut caused them to come up to our car. And the last thing they expected to do was to find two young girls in the car. So you go to the hospital right away, I'm assuming? Yes, we go to the hospital right away and my dad came up and I'll never forget being in the hospital. I was mean, I was sassy, I was yelling at my dad like, where were you? How come you didn't find us? And did you go to Mexico? My family, my parents and my brother and I were supposed to go to, on a trip on Christmas day and, and here's my dad, just this blubbering man, just crying, just hugging me because of course they didn't go to Mexico. Of course they had been looking for us. And you know, it gets me a little teary eyed now, the fact, now that I'm a mom, yeah. I can't even imagine what my parents went through, but you know, he didn't care what I said to him. The fact that he was actually talking sure. to me was you know, something that he got to hold on to. You were missing on Christmas Day? Christmas Day and New Year's. We were, we were lost December 23rd, 1987, and we were found January 2nd, 1988. Wow. So you're in the hospital and, and then you, you get more bad news. You're not completely in the clear here. Yes. What did they say to you? Well, we actually had frostbite on all our extremities. So hands, nose, ears, and feet. And immediately everything started to come back but my feet. So they first started talking to my parents about amputation and prosthetics, but they didn't come to me yet because they're trying to heal me. Mm -hmm. And eventually they had to come to me because I was 19, I was a young adult. And they provided a video of a woman who had a prosthetic leg like mine, took it off, took it on, and I laughed at him. I said, I'm never gonna take my legs off. I'm gonna sleep in them. And you know, I was so naive and innocent, but I knew I had to agree to this surgery to get better. What was that experience like for you going from that active 19 year old that loved to ski to now having to relearn how to walk and still I'm sure in your mind getting over what had just happened to you and processing that. Yeah, it was, it was life altering. Um, like I said, we, I wound up growing up very quickly and trying to, you know, questioning God, you know, mm -hmm. why, why me, why this, why that? And, but also being so grateful for a second chance at life. Yeah. because you know my life was saved on that mountain. Sometimes I wonder why, but then I look around here, I look at you, um, I look at this beautiful platform that I've been given to, to help others, yeah. to provide resiliency, a sense of security, and I know for me, a sense of beauty comes from within. It doesn't matter you know, what's on the outside, it mm -hmm. all comes from within. So Absolutely. it's been a beautiful journey. In 2001, you became the first female bilateral amputee to run a half marathon. Yes. And then 15 years later, yes. You ran the marathon in Chicago. Yes, our um, hometown. Yes, Chicago, which I love. And then also, I used to live in Boston, so the Boston Marathon bombings to me was such a, it just it impacted me a ton. And you ran the Chicago Marathon in honor of the victims of the Boston Marathon, which I think is so special. And for you, must have meant a lot. Yeah, well, my ultimate goal was to run the Boston Marathon. Yeah. And so through some connections, I knew I could get in, but I didn't feel comfortable. I really wanted to run one marathon before I ran Boston. Okay. So why not Chicago? It's flat. Did Boston just feel bigger to you? or? Uh, Boston felt like, it, I don't know if it was bigger or, I mean, it just, it's the Boston Marathon. It's huge. It, it's, it, you know, and it's just the history and then what had happened in 2013 mm -hmm. and the relationships that I now had developed, I thought, 
what a way to attribute to the city and to the survivors by coming back and running it. Yeah. And so, but I wanted to complete one marathon before I qualified for Boston. And that's what Chicago did for me. Okay. And so I ran Chicago in October of 2015, and then I ran Boston and completed it in April of 2016. I remember I used to cover the Boston Marathon, yeah. and one of the, I think everyone should go stand at the finish line yes. one time in their life, because it will change you. Yeah. And I remember standing there, and you just see people cross the finish line just in tears, and I would break down every time. Yeah. Um, like the stories that people have overcome and the things that they have been through, for you to cross that finish line, what what goes through your mind in those moments? Like what was the the thing that was pushing you over the edge there? Uh, I think for the Boston Marathon, it was the city itself and mm -hmm. the relationships I had met from the bombing and the survivors. And I had mentioned her earlier, my girlfriend Celeste Corcoran was at the finish line and there's incredible footage of me almost like falling into her arms. Yeah. And just, um, I mean, it gets me all, you know, a little verklempt. I mean, you know, yeah. what, what else do you say? I, I can go back to that time. Um, and it was very trying because I had problems with my prosthetics. My training wasn't where it was supposed to be like it was for Chicago. Mm -hmm. But there was no way I was going to give up. I was going to finish it. And I did. You know, I owed that to my two guides that I was running with, but also knowing that Celeste was at that finish line waiting for me. Check out our YouTube channel, Fair Game on FS1, to catch all the best highlights of our show. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode.